At Easter, we remember the resurrection of Christ from the tomb nearly 2,000 years ago. But what does that really mean to you now? Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve explains the power of the resurrection of Christ and our redemption. Lee Strobel was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He had a degree in journalism. He had a degree in law from Yale Law School. He was an avowed atheist. He married a girl named Leslie. She was an agnostic. They were living life, had two kids, just living for sin and for self. Lee said since he didn't believe in God, he was just trying to find all the pleasure he could out of life and leading a very hedonistic, selfish, self-centered, pleasure-seeking life. Well, one day something horrible happened, horrible in Lee's mind. His wife, Leslie, went to church and became a Christian. Horrors to Lee. That was the worst. How could my wife do this, become a Christian? I can't live with a Christian. I'm an atheist. I know that God doesn't exist. He went to church with her to see if he could pull her out of the quote-unquote cult that she was in, this Christian cult. And he said after that first time at church, he made the decision, well, I just need to show her that this Christianity stuff is wrong. I need to show her that this is just a lie. This is just a bunch of baloney. And so he started on this quest to disprove Christianity. And a friend of his said, well, listen, Lee, if you want to disprove Christianity, all you have to do is attack the resurrection of Jesus. If you can show that the resurrection of Jesus is a lie, is a fabricated lie, then Christianity will fall like a house of cards because everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So for the next year and nine months, Lee Strobel went on a quest to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And at the end of one year and nine months, Lee Strobel gave his life to Jesus Christ. He said, it is beyond a doubt that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I can't get past the evidence. And he gave his life to Christ. He wrote the book, The Case for Christ, in 2007. Ten years later, they turned it into a movie, The Case for Christ, which details his life. An excellent movie if you get a chance to see it. Here we are today. We're gathered for another Easter. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross, died on Friday. We call it Good Friday. They didn't call it Good Friday. They called it Terrible Friday, Horrible Friday. For his followers, that Friday when Jesus was crucified was the worst day in the world. It became Good Friday because of Resurrection Sunday. And Resurrection Sunday, Jesus Christ rising from the dead, that changed everything. And the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, those things are melded together, and that spells victory for every single person who puts his faith and trust in Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the greatest event in the history of the world It's the event that changed everything, that changed every, the the opportunity for everyone for all eternity. And here's the sad reality. So many people in our world, they don't know anything about it. Well, they've heard of Easter. I mean, who hasn't heard of Easter? But I saw a man on the street interview where somebody was just asking uh, passers-by at a mall or some kind of outdoor uh, shopping area, and they were just saying, you know, w- w- what is Easter? What does Easter mean to you? 
And people would say, well, eggs, Easter means eggs. Easter means the Easter bunny. Easter means Easter candy. Easter means a new outfit. Easter means lunch with the family. We all get together at Easter. And one after one after another, they talked all about this stuff, and none of it had to do with Jesus. We call this day Easter. It's Resurrection Day. It it's every, has everything to do with Jesus. But people miss it. They don't know what it is about. And here's the sad reality. Many people who come to church at Easter, and Easter's a time where people come to church. They're, you know, a lot of CEOs, Christmas, Easter only, but they're going to come. I'm glad you're here. Hey, if you don't normally come here and you're here today, uh, I want you to know I am so glad you are here. But lots of people who come to church on Easter, they don't really know what it's about either. Now, they know they're smart enough to know, well, it's, it's about Jesus and it's about the resurrection, but they don't really know what that means. They know on the surface, but they don't know deep down what exactly does that mean. Someone has well said, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, then nothing really matters. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. But if Jesus Christ did rise from the dead, nothing else really matters. That becomes the be-all, end-all of life. Jesus conquered death, he conquered hell, and he conquered the grave. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every single one of the gospel writers talk about it. It's not an add-on, it's not a tack-on, it's not an epilogue, it's not, oh, by the way, he rose from the dead. It is the exclamation point of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is the focal point of everything. He said he was going to rise from the dead, and you know what? He did rise from the dead. Very interesting. The church has never met on Friday. They always meet on Sunday. Friday is the day he died. Sunday is the day he rose from the dead. Sunday became the meeting time for the church, and it's called in the book of the Revelation, the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day. We meet on the first day of the week, Sunday, the Lord's Day, to celebrate the resurrected Savior. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all talk about the resurrection. We want to look at the resurrection from Mark chapter 16. It says this, beginning in verse 1, And when the Sabbath was over, the Sabbath is Saturday, Jesus goes into the ground on Friday, and uh, to the Jew, any part of a day constituted a day. So if you're in the ground, uh, you're in the tomb Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even though it's, if you do the math and you say Jesus was three days, it's not 72 hours. It's just any part of a day uh, is considered a day. So he's in the ground Friday, he's there Saturday, he's there Sunday, a portion of Sunday. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and uh, Sol Salome uh, James is one of the apostles, not Big James, not Peter, James, and John. James was, that, they called him Big James. Uh, this is Little James. He's got another name called James the Less. I like Little James better than James the Less, you know? You wouldn't want to be, what's your name? I'm James the Less. Less than what? Well, less than Big James. But he's Little James, and his mother was there with Mary Magdalene, and they brought spices that they might come and anoint him, anoint the body. They did that to cover the smell. That's what they did for their dead. And very early on the first day of the week, Sunday, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. The other gospel writers tell us this is an angel. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus was a real person, came from a real place, had a real background. Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He really did die. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. 
He is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he said to you. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. What does the resurrection of Jesus really mean for you and for me? Two meanings that are critical for all of us to understand not just surface, but down deep. There are two meanings that if you uh, let these get into your heart, they will change your life. Number one, Jesus is Savior and Lord. That's what the resurrection means. It means that Jesus is Savior and Lord. You know, in John chapter 4, we get an, a, a sample of this, a, a preview of this when Jesus goes to Samaria and he sees the woman at the well, and he has a conversation with her, and then she runs back and gets all the men and says, hey, come see a man who told me all the things I've ever done. This, this can't be the Christ, can it? And they come, and they talk to Jesus, and they say that you are indeed the Savior of the world. Well, the resurrection shows that he's the Savior of the world. World. The resurrection shows that he is Lord. He is God in the flesh. In Matthew's gospel, when Jesus rises from the dead, he meets the women at the tomb. First he meets Mary Magdalene, and then he meets the other women at the tomb. And when they saw him, the Bible says that they fell at his feet, and they were holding onto his feet, and they worshiped him. They worshiped him. You're not supposed to worship anybody but God. Jesus Christ is God. He is Lord and Savior. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, that's 50 days after this, 50 days after Passover comes Pentecost. Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came to live inside believers. And Peter got up to preach and he said this, this Jesus God raised up again to whom we are all witnesses. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He is both Lord, he's God in the flesh, he is Christ, he is Messiah, he is the deliverer, the redeemer, the savior. Now, the resurrection is what authenticates these things. See, the resurrection authenticated who he was and who he is. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he would be a liar because he said he was going to rise from the dead. He said repeatedly in the Gospels he was going to rise from the dead. He said at the beginning of his ministry, so one of the first things that Jesus did when he began his public ministry was he cleansed the temple. He did it at the beginning of his ministry. He did it at the end of his ministry. The last week of his life, when he came into Jerusalem, after the Palm Sunday, the very next day, he comes and he cleanses the temple. He turns over the tables of the money changers. He casts out those who are selling sheep and oxen and all that and said, stop making my father's house a place of merchandise. It's supposed to be a place of prayer for all the nations. Well, when he did that the first time, it, the, the religious leaders who were over the temple area, they got really mad, really mad. And they said, what sign do you show us seeing that you're doing these things? And he said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. And they looked at him and said, it took 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it up in three days? But John said he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, Peter on the day of Pentecost says that, that God raised him up again, but Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days, I will raise it up again. So who raised Jesus from the dead? Did God? Yes. Did Jesus? Yes. How, how can both those be true? They can both be true because Jesus is God. He's the second person in the Holy Trinity. God is one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And his resurrection authenticated who he was and who he is. Revelation chapter 1, John is exiled on the island of Patmos. He's breaking rocks on the island of Patmos. And he sees the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his beauty, in all of his glory. He said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. 
This is John who laid his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, but now he sees him in, in glory and splendor, and he falls at his feet as a dead man. And the Lord says to him, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. He has conquered death, as we sang just a minute ago. He has conquered death. He's the living one. Now, he said to Martha in John chapter 11, when he was coming for Lazarus's funeral, you remember that? He said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, you can't be the resurrection and the life and die and stay dead. You'd kind of have to give up that moniker. But Jesus is the resurrection and the life because he died on Friday and he rose on Sunday. His resurrection authenticated who he was, who he is, the great I am. We sang about him just a moment ago. But then secondly, his resurrection empowered what he came to do. What did Jesus come to do? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to die. The little song I love, it says he was born in the shadow of a tree, the shadow of a tree. Ever present was the knowledge he would be hanging on a tree, the tree of Calvary. He came for the purpose of dying on the cross for sinners. And so the resurrection gives power to the cross. See, the cross by itself doesn't have power. The cross has to be connected to the empty tomb because a dead Savior can't save anybody. A dead Savior, if Jesus never rose from the dead, then he, he would be a liar because in John 2, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Well, he wouldn't have done that. So if Jesus tells a lie, then how can we trust him to tell us the truth? But he did rise again, and that gave power to the cross. Paul was dealing with false teachers in Corinth, and the false teachers in Corinth came in and told the people, hey, there's no such thing as a resurrection. You're not going to be raised up. A resurrection is ridiculous. What kind of a thinking person believes that people are going to be raised? In this Greek philosophy, the thought was that uh, matter is evil, the body is evil, only the spirit is good. So why would you want to raise up the body since the body is evil and, and not any good anyway? And Paul responds to that, and he says this, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. If we have trusted in Christ only in this life, we are of all men most to be pitied. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead. But Jesus did rise from the dead, and that changes everything. It shows that he is both Lord and Christ, Savior and Lord. You mark it down, Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead, Mohammed is dead, and Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. There is no one else like Jesus. A Muslim in Africa came to Christ, came to faith in Christ. He was talking to some of his friends, and they asked him, why did you leave Islam? Why did you embrace Christianity? And he said, well, it's kind of like this. He said, I'm walking down a road, and I come to a fork in the road, and I don't know which way to go, and there are two men there at the fork. One is dead, and one is alive. Which one would you ask directions of? He said, I ask directions from the live one. Jesus Christ is alive forevermore. So what's the first meaning of the resurrection? Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is God in the flesh. He is God's only son and man's only savior. Second meaning, Jesus can forgive. He can transform. He can change your life. He can restore. He's the God who can do anything. Lee Strobel's life was transformed by Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Your life can be transformed too. Now, remember this. We talk about the gospel. The word gospel in Greek is eongelion. It means good news, good story. And the gospel is good news for hopeless sinners. 
hopeless, helpless sinners, we have good news for you. Here's the problem people have today. They don't like to think of themselves as hopeless, helpless sinners. But newsflash, that's what everyone is. What everyone is. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone's a sinner. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Separation from God, death to the body, and separation from God forever and ever and ever. That's, that's serious business to be a sinner. And it's not like, well, how dare you call me a sinner? We're calling everybody a sinner. Everyone is a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And the gospel of Jesus Christ says, although you're a sinner, Jesus died for you on the cross and rose again from the dead. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can be forgiven, you can be transformed, you can be cleansed, you can receive the gift of eternal life. And all you have to do is repent and believe those two things and that's the gospel of jesus christ good news for the hopeless sinner now this is what the bible says about us as, as human beings all of us it says that we are sinners and we have a stain because of sin we have a stain inside a stain on our heart the stain of sin and that separates us from god and Jeremiah 2.22 says, though you wash yourself with lye, L-Y-E, lye, and use much soap, soap, the stain of your iniquity is before me, declares the Lord. So what can you do to get rid of the stain of sin in your heart? I tell that to kids sometimes when they come in and they're, they're with their mom and dad and they're, they're talking about, I think my child is ready to receive Christ. I'll talk about being dirty because especially with little boys, you can talk to them. Have you ever played in the mud? Oh yeah, little kids like to play in the mud. Little boys like to play in the mud. I said, you know, when you play in the, in the mud and the dirt and you get dirty and then you, you come inside for dinner, what does your mom tell you to do? Wash your hands. You got to wash your hands before we're going to eat dinner. And so I say, you wash your hands, you can get your hands all clean. They can be all muddy, you can get them all clean. I said, what do you do if you have mud on your heart? How, how do you get that off? How, how do you get an internal stain off? It, the song says, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is the only thing that can cleanse. Some people they wonder, they say, well, you know, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? I mean, God is God. He, you know, he can do anything because he's God. And so why did God set it up that, that he would have to send his son to become a man to die a brutal death on the cross? Why couldn't he have just said to everybody, just be good? Why couldn't he have said, uh, you know, just go to church once in a while? Why couldn't he have done it that way? Because God is just, and God is righteous, and God is holy. And God says that sin must be accounted for. And, and God is too pure to look upon evil, and God won't let sin in his presence. And you have sin, and I have sin, and we have sin. And, and from the fall of Adam, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the only way for sinners to be made right is through the death of God's own Son. How do I know that? Because Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane prayed and he sweat blood and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And the silence from his father said, my son, there is no other way. You're going to have to take on the sin of the whole world. You're going to have to die in their place. You're going to have to receive all the wrath that should have fallen on them. It's going to fall on you so that they can be set free. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And Jesus did take all our wrath on the cross and he rose again from the dead and the cross and the empty tomb are welded together. You can't pull them apart. And the empty tomb gives power to the cross to forgive. Good news for the hopeless sinner. You know, you think of somebody like Mary Magdalene. She's the first one at the tomb. Mary Magdalene had seven demons in her. Jesus delivered her from seven demons. She put her faith and trust in Jesus. Her life was so transformed, radically changed. Can you think of the awful life that that lady had? Seven demons? Wow. I mean, the, the sins that she committed, the things that she did, the things that she experienced, awful. And the Lord saved her. 
Now, you have such a contrast. You have her who gets saved, and then you have a guy like Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. Jesus says to him, you have to be born again. You must be born again. You can't enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Man, he's the top of the heap. He's the most moral man in all of Israel. She is the bottom of the barrel. And whether you're the top of the heap or the bottom of the barrel, everyone has to come to Christ in order to be saved. And that is the good news of the gospel. I don't care if you're down and out. I don't care if you're up and out. You're out and I'm out. But Jesus says if we'll put our faith and trust in him, he'll forgive us and he'll cleanse us and he'll transfer us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, into the kingdom of light and love and forgiveness. That is good news. So good news for hopeless sinners. But let me tell you something else. It's also good news for guilt-ridden saints. You know what we tend to do? We tend to rejoice over people that had a Mary Magdalene experience. I mean, you had seven demons and you came to Christ and he transformed your life and, and man, we want to bring her out on the talk shows and, and write books and all that. Look at her life. Just like Lee Strobel, I'm an atheist and I put my faith in Christ and my life has totally changed. We love that. And so the worse your life was before Christ, it's such a testimony for what Jesus can do to change your life. But here's the thing. See, most people don't have a testimony of, hey, I was inhabited by seven demons. We don't have a testimony was that, yeah, I grew up an atheist, I hated God, I was trying to destroy Christianity. We don't have a testimony like that. Many people have a testimony that says, you know, my parents were Christians and they brought me to church and when I was, when I was young, I saw that I was a sinner and I needed a savior and I put my trust in Jesus. That's the testimony of a lot of people. But then as I started to live life, I started to drift away from the Lord and I made some bad choices and I made some sinful choices and I moved in with my boyfriend, I moved in with my girlfriend and I got pregnant and I had an abortion and I did this and I did that and I did the other and here I am, I know I'm a Christian and I'm so far from God and I'm a guilt-ridden saint. Where's the good news for me? Verse seven, the angel says, to the women at the tomb, but go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he said to you, and Peter. Did you know that Matthew, Luke, John, they don't tell us that. Only Mark tells us and Peter. And Peter's interesting. Why is Mark the only guy that mentions and Peter? You know, the early church fathers said that Mark wrote Peter's gospel. Mark wrote Peter's gospel. Yeah, ask yourself the question, well, we have a gospel of Matthew. He was one of the 12 disciples. We have a gospel from John. He was one of the 12 disciples, very close. The, the disciple whom Jesus loved is how he refers to himself. And we have Luke. Luke's the historian that spent so much time with Paul. But we don't, why don't we have a gospel from Peter? Peter was the number one name in disciples. He was the leader of the pack. And he doesn't write a gospel. It's the gospel of Mark. Mark wrote Peter's gospel. And in Mark's gospel, Peter's gospel, and Peter, and Peter. Why do we read that, and Peter? Because the last time we left Peter, he had denied Christ. Very interesting between Peter and Judas. See, people are very familiar with the name Judas. Not very many people name their kids Judas. Judas is the betrayer. Judas, Jesus said, it would have been better for that man if he had never been born. Awful. Betray Jesus for what? For 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Judas hated Jesus. Why? Because Jesus didn't do what he wanted him to do. See, Judas signed up 
thinking that this, this guy is going to be the Messiah. He's going to be the deliverer, and I'm going to be on the ground floor. This is like getting in on Amway when it first starts, and man, I'm going to be one of the, the, the beginners, you know, and I'm going to make, uh, do so well uh, financially and, and uh, you know, all these other ways, and I'm going to be famous, and I'm going to have all this power. That was his MO. That's why he signed on. He didn't love Jesus. And when he realized Jesus is not taking over, he's not doing what I want him to do, then he says, I got I to, gotta, you know, cut this out. What can I get for him? I'll sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. I'll get something out of the deal because Judas was a lover of money and he betrays Christ. The, we could say, that's the worst sin ever committed, betraying Christ. Peter didn't betray Christ. He denied Christ. Three times. And what made it so bad was at the Last Supper, just hours before he's going to deny Christ, Jesus says to the disciples, you're all going to desert me. And Peter says, no, that'll never, I'll never do that. These other guys might desert you. I'm never going to desert you. I won't forsake you. Lord, with you, I'm ready to go to prison and to death. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows, tonight. You're going to deny three times that you even know me. And he said, oh no, Lord, that will never happen. But we know what happened. They arrested Jesus. Peter was in the garden. What does he do? They come to arrest Jesus. He has a a sword. He cuts off, tries to cut a guy's head off, and he ends up cutting off his ear. And so Peter is like, hey, I did something I shouldn't have done. I, I could get in big trouble here. And, uh, He flees, but John followed Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, and Peter followed uh, from a distance, and John had some connections, and so Peter gets into the courtyard, and Peter is there. He's warming himself by the fire, and a little slave girl says, hey, I know you. You're one of his disciples. He said, I don't don't know the man. And then he leaves the fire and he goes by the the gateway. A little while later, somebody else comes up to him and says, hey, aren't you one of his disciples? He said, I am not. And he said it with an oath, it says in the book of Matthew, with an oath. What does that mean? That means like he said, on my mother's grave, I am not one of his. I don't know him. And then a little while later, this happened over a period of about two hours, these denials. A little while later, they were looking at him again, and they said, you are one of his disciples. Your Galilean accent gives you away. And the scripture says he cursed and swore and said, I don't know the man. We think of that. Cursed and swore. He's going into sailor mode. He's going to talk like a sailor. He's going to let out a string of profanity. That would have been better if he had done that. He didn't do that. He cursed and he swore. This is what that means. He said, as God is my witness and may God strike me dead if I'm lying, I don't know him. And immediately a cock crowed. And Peter remembered what the Lord had said to him. And the Bible says in the book of Luke that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Was it a look of surprise? No. He knew he was going to do what he did. Was it a look of disdain? No, he loved Peter. It was a look of wounded love. In the Lord's great hour of need for someone to stand up for him as he's being beaten and lied about. He needed someone. Here is my number one disciple, and he denies that he even knows me. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And you think, as we all would think, if I'm Peter, I have so burned my bridge with the Lord. There is no coming back to him. I denied that I even knew him. He told me I was going to do it, and I argued with him, and I denied that I even knew him, and my life in the ministry is over, and and there's no way I can ever be right with God. Go tell his disciples and Peter, and Peter. 
I think there's some Ann Peters here today. Some Ann Peters, and you have been saved, but you're so far away from the Lord, and you just feel like I can't go back to him because of the sins I've committed. Whatever you've done, it's not as bad as what Peter did. Not as bad as what Peter did. But you need to do what he did in response. See, Judas went out covered in remorse, covered in regret, and he said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And the chief priest said, what is that to us? See to that yourself. And he threw the 30 pieces of silver, and he went out and hanged himself. Trying to escape the hell within him, he stepped into the hell before him. Just covered in regret and in remorse. Peter was convicted by what he did. And he wept bitterly. And he cried out to God for mercy and grace and forgiveness. Hey, you know what? In hell, you're going to find a host, multitudes, millions, and billions of people that are going to have remorse and going to have regret, but you won't find one person who's repentant. Listen, there's a big difference between repentance and regret. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says this, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What is repentance? Repentance is turning from sin and self and turning to God and putting your faith and trust in the Lord. That's repentance. And whether you're here and you've never trusted Christ, it starts with leaving the pigsty and coming to him and putting your faith and trust in him. And whether you are a Christian who has gotten away from the Lord, it's the same thing. You leave your sin and you come back to him and you, you trust him again and you repent And you turn to him and say, oh, God, I've been walking in the shadows. I want to walk in the light with you. You know, it's interesting in the 800s A.D., there was a symbol for Christianity that's kind of forgotten today. But they would put it on the steeples of the churches. It's a rooster. A rooster. Why would you put a rooster on the steeples of the churches? They did it to remind the Christians, listen. If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Peter thought he could stand, and he couldn't. And Peter should have been praying in the garden, and he wasn't. He was sleeping, and Satan came and sifted him like wheat. Remember the rooster. Don't be so boastful about your strength because all your strength comes from Jesus. It doesn't come from you. Secondly, when you're called upon and put on the hot seat, don't deny Christ. And thirdly, when you hear the rooster, Know that that is a call to repentance. That's a call that says you can get your life right with God. You have messed up as a Christian, but you can come back to him. Go tell his disciples and Peter. And you're the end, Peter. And the rooster call is for you. Has the fact of Christ's resurrection made a difference in you? Have you come to know, in a real and personal way, come to know the Savior, who died and rose again. If you just have cold, dead religion, I'd like to lead you in a prayer to take head knowledge to your heart. So pray with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart and in my life. I ask you to change me from the inside out, and I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in, and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you. Take the time to contact me. You are important to us, and you're important to God, and we're here for you. Thank you for watching From His Heart, the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan at fromhisheart.org. Real truth.